Hello and welcome to the Terrace Scottish Football Podcast. My name is Craig Telfer and on this occasion I am joined by my close associate Sean McGuigan. Hello there. And you know what happens when the Shane Ritchie and Colleen Nolan of the Terrace get together. <laughs> a less controversial coupling. Well, that's right. I mean, are they misogynistic? Is it misogynistic to use them as a comparison? I've absolutely no idea. But if it is, I've no doubt we will find out in a couple of hours' time when Fowler sticks this up on Twitter. <laughs> uh, Sean and I, just much like Colleen Nolan and Shane Ritchie, whenever they got together, they spent their time talking about lower league Scottish football. <laughs> so actually, just a wee sidebar, I was reading up on the Nolans uh, before uh, we was pulling the, the, this introduction together. They were quite big in Japan. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, they released, a lot of, uh, released, a, uh, released an album full of covers, uh, Michael Jackson covers and so on, uh, that was quite, uh, quite popular in Japan. Well, there you go. There you go. It's like, I remember thinking about Amy McDonald, you know, the, the, the Scottish pop star with the guitar, um, her husband. Uh, well, he's the, big in the, Japan. She's not big in Japan, but she's quite big in Germany, apparently. She's very big in Germany. I wondered wh- how she was so wealthy, given the fact that certainly this country, I know that she's well regarded, but I don't know if it's because her music's actually good or she's just Scottish. You know, if an artist's Scottish, it, it sort of elevates them in the, the mind of the media uh, consciousness. But she's very big in Germany, and I think that's um, that's why she's able to do do so well. So there you go, there you go. Oh, you, you, you froze here. I've, I've also just realised that you. Uh, I've also just realised that your uh, name is Pontius Pilot today yeah, on yeah. Uh, Riverside. So fair play. Yeah, well, there's 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 another thing. We peek behind the curtain for for our listeners. Uh, every time Sean and I do a podcast together, we we give names. I try to give humorous names, sort of in jokes. But this isn't so much of an in joke. This is just Pontius Pilot is the name I've gone for. Of course, he was the the judge who quite literally washed his hands of whether or not Jesus should be crucified. Yeah, I, I don't really know the, the, the kind of ins and outs, but I, I know he was uh, apparently a bit of a bad egg. Yeah, no, was, he not, was he a bad egg or was he just sort of someone who just made a, a bad decision at the wrong time? I, I don't know, I'll have to go back and read up. Yeah, that's uh, if you know about Pontius Pilate's backstory and whether or not he was a bad egg, do get in touch with myself and Sean. Uh, please post it on the, the Discord. We won't read it, but someone else who does go on there quite often can tell us all about it. Now, on today's show, uh, a bit of mixed communication here between myself and Sean because Sean thought we were going to wrap up the weekend's games. I thought we were going to preview the, the games coming up next week and the playoffs. So it's, it's a, bit of a, a bit of a mishmash between the two of them. So unfortunately, Sean, I haven't really had the opportunity to patent this kind of podcast. So I've no doubt that other podcast, the one where all the reply guys do, they'll probably be discussing um, something similar like this at some point. So, But nevertheless, we'll give it a go. We'll give it a go. I've got notes about all the playoff games. Sean has got notes about the, the games that took place <laughs> at the weekend. So we're going to try and we're going to try and meet in the middle. I've watched enough highlights uh, to, to, to know at least comments on the games. I get the chance to, to read Pine Ball. We'll get a bit more of a flavour of them. But nevertheless, Sean, we'll give it a good go. And we'll start by going to the bottom of the championship where there were two massive games that would determine who would finish in ninth place. Queen's Park were in eighth place. They were taking on Airdronians and they were just one point ahead of Inverness Caledonian Thistle who were taking on Greenock Morton. And although both sides won, that was enough to make sure the Spiders finish in eighth place and Cali Thistle will contest the playoffs. They're going to be facing off against Montrose who finished fourth in League One. And I suppose we'll start with that match, Sean, that took place at the Caledonian Stadium. 3-1, three very well-taken goals for Inverness, Caledonian Thistle. A spectacular breakdown from Robbie Muirhead, who was booked in the space of about (laughs) two bookings in the space of 10 seconds to get himself sent off. What did you make of this game? I mean, I suppose, as did both games really panned out how I expected them to. Yeah. Like there is, certainly over the, the second half of the season, from about January onwards, there is very little between, uh, probably between Dungeon United, and, remove Dungeon United and Abro from the equation, there's very little between everybody else in the division. Yes, uh, Airdrie have been the, was the form team from maybe probably January onwards. However, when you have Queen's Park playing uh, against an Airdrie side that do not have uh, a kind of horse in the race and are resting players and you have Inverness, Taking on a Morton side, they've had a weird season. Yeah, like As Morton have had. Morton's like Morton, ultimately, yeah, the the first third was terrible, and the yeah. back third was terrible. But the bit in the middle was amazing. Best, best team in the league. <laughs> bizarre, <laughs> absolutely bizarre. 
Uh, so I, I can't. Ex- I, I did expect uh, Inverness to win this one. I, 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 I listened to to Duke Emery's uh, comments with, with interest. He he thought that that even the Inverness players were saying it wasn't a penalty, which gave uh, Inverness their, their second goal. i am honest, watching it, I thought it did look like a penalty. Like, we only have one angle, and I've only watched it once, so, so maybe it wasn't. But to be fair, I, I could completely understand how the, how the referee gave it. As for, uh, as, for Muirhead's, as for Muirhead's red card, extraordinary. Like, we have, we've had previous in terms of him kind of sarcastically uh, clapping a referee, but I, th- I thought he could have had a straight red card for his, for yeah. his kind of elbow challenge. Mm-hmm. It almost felt like he got away with that. Was he was he booked for diving? Am I right in saying that the first yellow card was for a dive? I, I, I think that's what happened. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, in terms of the, the, the passage of play, it looked like he... Not not just... And it wasn't he... What made it so bad, I thought, was... It wasn't like he was going up for a header and just leant with his elbow. Yeah. Like he literally just swung his elbow mm-hmm. at the defender. Uh, seconds later, then... Went to ground looking for a looking for a penalty. It looked like he got a, a yellow card for the dive, and then his comments to the referee uh, gave him an, an immediate second yellow. So I had a very very strange reaction from uh, Muirhead. Bad. I, I must admit, I, I thought that Inverness were were worthy winners, and I, I, I didn't agree with uh, Emery's comments at, at at full time. Yeah, I thought Inverness looked really good as well. I really liked the goal. Morgan Boyce's goal was fantastic. It's it was one of those ones that sort of come to you in slow motion. Yep. And and a lot of the time, especially when it's a big defender like Morgan Boyd, it's only going one place, and that's into the sea. But he really <laughs> he, he really connected with this really well. It's a it's a great finish from uh, from about eight yards out, and I really liked um, the the goal that, that that sort of put the the ribbon on it from Sean McAllister. Sort of good uh, low drive from from the edge of the area. But I I, I was the same, Sean, going into this one. I fully expected. I fully expected Cali Thistle to win this one, and it's not because Cali Thistle are a fantastic side by any means, but it's because that that Morton really have had just such a that this this is a team who are just I think we said this in last week's show or, or a show previously they're a team that are just looking forward to get to the end of the season and just have a big reset. And there's a number of players who aren't going to be there next season. Uh, Dougie Emery will have will I think probably a, a, half that squad are going to move on. He's he'll, he'll turn them over. It'll be really interesting to see what he does there. But the club, since since his appearance in a view from the terrace, when everything was going so well, ever since then, it's they, they've really hit the skids. And like, probably like a lot of the games at the end of the season, where there is a team who really have something to fight for against a team who their season's more or less wrapped up. These are the kind of results that you would expect. However, I was I was a bit surprised to see. Airdrie really get the drawers taken off them against Queen's Park because I thought that, that given they have got a smaller squad, I would have thought that they would have wanted maybe to have played their the best eleven possible going into this one. And obviously that wasn't the case. It was more of a an odds and sods. And I think Queen's Park really, really did a number on them. And I think that the 2 0 scoreline is perhaps uh, again going by the highlights, really good highlights of Queens Park. I don't think the highlights were quite reflective of how dominant the Spiders were in that game. Yeah, I mean, I think Reese McCabe done the same last season. I'm sure, like the last game of the season, uh, going into those Championship promotion playoffs, I'm sure he rested a, a, a good load of players. But you're right in terms of they, they probably have a, a a smaller squad. However, the, the fact they rested. I think Hancock was on the bench. Yeah, Craig Megler, Watson, Callum Fordyce, Todorov, yeah. McGill. Like all of them might have, might have uh, played. Well, certainly first four maybe would have played. But aye, they very much look like a team that was they really that interested in, in in what was going on. However, Queens Park did look good, and it, it's interesting. Like we're, we're speaking about Queens Park, we're speaking about Inverness, and like Callum Davidson. I, I don't necessarily mean from us. Callum Davidson said a, a lot of praise since he came in, rightly so. I don't know, and and I certainly haven't given Duncan Ferguson very much praise since he came in the season. But since so, Davidson was appointed on January the ninth, and how do we look at terms of the how many points Queens Park and Inverness have picked up since then? Queens Park have only picked up one more point than Inverness. Is that since right? That point, right? But Davidson wow. is obviously uh, regarded as have had like a really positive impact mm-hmm. on this Queens Park team. Ferguson seems to have less of a I don't know, a positive air about what he's mm, achieved. That's no, fair. He's, I'm saying what he's achieved. They've finished ninth and they're going to be in the, the, the relegation playoffs. But on top, I've, of, on top of that, I, I've, not well. fancied, I've not fancied anybody to, to, to 
any other second team to come up for, for League One this season. No. I would still go along with that. Yeah, I, going on, that, that's very interesting, that the perception of the two of them, that Callum Davidson's come in and, and completely reinvigorated Queen's Park. And, and there's Ferguson, who I think has been perhaps quite disappointing, given what people perhaps expected from him. And I think that might be the difference between Callum Davidson might have been seen as, yes, amazing in his first season at St. Johnston, but that petered out to the point that people, I think a lot of Saintees were just like, listen, thanks for the double, but can you fuck off now, please? And whereas Duncan <laughs> Ferguson, you're expecting you're expecting the same guy who was able to batter two burglars, but instead you got the burglars that were battered, if you know, if you know what I mean. And, and it's only... But to finish in ninth place with a positive goal difference and having conceded behind Dundee United the fewest goals in the division... That seems that seems remarkable to me, but I thought, I'm sure it was getting to the stage, particularly as we went into the into the third quarter, into the final quarter, where it was just they were just drawing a lot of games, and draws were never going to be enough to to, to get them out. However, I do think they will be too strong for Montrose, and then whoever finishes between um, between Hamilton and and, and Alloa. But just on the the Queen's Park game, because after you and I had a discussion about how what shape this podcast would take and realise, oh fuck, we're going in two completely different directions here. I watched the highlights for the Queen's Park uh, Airdrie match and I've got to say, and I think this is this is a, a, a mea culpa from, from both of us here, Kelly and Sheridan, we were sorry. We thought you were going to be absolutely gubbins here. There's an episode of A View from the Terrace that we were preparing for and it was, I think it was like signings, we're making a five-a-size team out of signings, that January signings that had been made. And one of the production teams suggested Kelly and Sheridan going from Cali Thistle to Queen's Park. And you and I were like, pish, absolutely pish. <laughs> Leave it to the lower league experts. He'll play about four games, get injured, and we'll never see him again. Oh my goodness. He has been an absolutely superb signing for Queen's Park. And he has really given them something that they were badly missing in the final third. And you can see how well he's linked up with Rudy Payton there. And going by the highlights of this game, pretty much everything good that they did came through him. No, I I think, I, I don't know if I've ever been so wrong about a, a, a signing ever. Like I presumed when he went to Queen's Park, he would play three substitute appearances. It would last about 24 minutes. However, he's, uh, I, I think he has been managed well. I, I will say that about Davison. Like he doesn't, he doesn't start every game, but he's got, I think it's four goals and five assists. I think he's contributing either a goal or, or creating one every 60 minutes or so Brilliant. in his time at, at, at Queen's Park. But like there was a point, and I, I, maybe this wasn't what like kind of a, a memory that was triggered when you were watching the the, the highlights. There's a point where he, he kind of just gets the ball and he's kind of wide on the left and he tries to kind of yeah. just dink the goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. And I was like, there, there's a real kind of air of Berbatov, like kind of, <laughs> kind of late age Berbatov here about him. But he's so unselfish, he's so hard working, he's, he's combined, he like combined so well with, with, with Rudy Payton. And I, I mean, I mean, I think everybody was reasonably doubtful in terms of that signing. He's certainly proven everybody wrong. And I now, mo- I now suspect that most Queen's Park fans would be very, very happy if he was given another another year or whatever. Yeah, definitely. I think his biggest contribution in the match was the assist for Rudy Payton's goal. Airdrie are trying to play the ball out from the back and he gets played to Murray Aiken, I yes, might be right in saying. Yep. And he's just too slow. And, and Sheridan's a big lad right on top of him, steals the ball off him and there's Payton with a really nice finish actually, sort of comes in onto his right and curls into the net. That's not my favourite thing about no. the goal. Not the assist, not the finish, but the celebration. Payton runs over to the away fans and he starts sort of standing with his arms wide out in front of two 14-year-old boys. I, and I thought that was hilarious. And you can see the wee boys pointing at him and, and giving it to him. And he's just standing there. And I thought, my goodness, imagine getting that worked up by a bunch of young teenagers. There, there appears to be beef between Peyton and Airdrie. I'm not entirely sure what it goes back to, but regardless, there, Does there it, appears to be beef. I think, Sean, sorry, I think it might go back to something to do with Rico Kitongo. Am I right the same agent? that? Or same agency? No, no, I think they were both playing for Queen of the South at the time when there was an allegation of racial abuse that was made okay. against Airdrie supporters. I think Peyton might have stuck up for Kitongo or he had something in a shirt or something like that. I might be wrong, I might be wrong, but I think that might be where the, the beef comes from. But I, I do think that Peyton is always, even at Queen of the South, he seems to 
like just enjoy celebrating in front of opposition fans, which I've always quite enjoyed. But yes, his, his celebration in front of two uh, small children was 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 very very funny. There was a suggestion on Pine Bovril that he was uh, flicking the V's, but unfortunately oh. the highlights uh, moves away before that potentially uh, happened. If you are ever making highlights and something interesting happens, don't cut away, don't edit it out, leave the good <laughs> stuff in there. Did you not learn anything from Stranraer to Clyde Nil earlier in the season? Could you imagine if they stopped filming? Well, there's the game, there, there's the game finished. Let's switch the camera off, and then missing big Ebo the kit man giving the fingers as he goes off. Terrible stuff. Film everything. Film everything. Don't edit it out. We want the truth. That's what we want. We don't. We don't. We don't want Queens Park's version of the truth. We just want the mm. truth. Uh, and I, I suppose, as well from a Queens Park perspective, a nice goal from from Liam McLeish to wrap up the finish, uh, the, wrap up the game at the at the death there. I'm very very interesting to see what they do next season because I think it's fair to say that the Marion Bucher experiment didn't work. They didn't. I, I know that. We've spoken about it in the past. The Bucher project that was a decade. It was going to take a decade for it to come to fruition. And, and let's be honest, we don't have the time or the patience for something to come to fruition in that length of time. You need to be winning ultimately on the pitch and Queen's Park weren't doing that. I think you're going to go back to a regular football club and they will bring through young guys. And I think that will still be Queen's Park's model will be to try and get as many young guys in the first team as possible. And it's great to see guys like McLeish coming in and, and making an impact. And I do think that they'll be seen by bigger clubs as a place to send their young players. I think they will want to develop players. However, you still need to have the experienced heads around them that can help these players blossom. Earlier in the campaign, they had too many guys of the same profile. It's actually quite similar to, to Chelsea. If, if you want, albeit on a, a much, much, much less grandiose scale where you're bringing so many young players and there's no one there to, to help them and, and pull them through those sticky moments. And I think that with guys like Sheridan, guys like Danny Wilson, guys like Sean Welsh, for instance, these are the guys that you need to create the spine of the team using these experienced heads. A really good goalkeeper in Callum Ferry as well, it's important to say. Build a team with experienced heads and then augment them with the young players. Don't just have a spine of young players. You need to to, to, to flesh them out. So I'm keen to see what the Spiders do with Davidson um, into the summer and into next season. Ah, they've essentially become like a normal championship a normal football team. club yeah. since, about, since about January uh, onwards. I, I, I do think it would have been very interesting to see how they reacted if they had been relegated to, to League One. Mm. Bear in mind they have, I think when Willie Hockey said he was getting involved, he was going to be there for 10 years. So to, to have such a kind of bump in the road, which would involve a relegate a, a massive backward step into League One, would have been interesting to see how they how they coped with that. But yeah, in terms of in terms of pushing on, I would expect them, depending on what their budget is, to with a a kind of proper manager in, mm. in Callum Davison in terms of a proper approach to to having experienced players rather than just a, a a team of kids. In terms of not having a manager that that takes off your best three players to bring on three third years in like the, the 81st minute or whatever, I would probably expect them to be okay, albeit it will be a very, presumably a, a very, very tight league next season where most teams would be hoping to finish in the in the top four. So a difficult division, but I, I expect Queen's Park to be better next season. Yeah, looking forward to seeing what they can do. And we'll just move on then, Sean, to the match that's coming up between Inverness, Caledonian, Thistle and Montrose. I think we touched on it very briefly. We both fancy Cali Thistle to not just beat Montrose, but to win the playoff outright. Uh, I, I think so, yeah. I mean, ultimately, but so how do we check back? So in terms of since the playoffs began, 11 championship teams have got relegated, and I think it's six have stayed up. Okay. So generally, historically, the team that finishes ninth does go down. However, I didn't check back this, but you would imagine that most teams that finish ninth have got an issue defensively, mm -hmm. but Queens like Inverness don't seem to have that. Mm. Like they like defensively, they seem fine mm -hmm. and they create chances and they're wasteful. So if if Inverness are reasonably adept at defensively against teams like Dungeon United, for example, then you would I fancy don't think, them to. I don't think Montrose are going to cause them too many difficulties uh, defensively, and that means if they continue to create the amount of chances that they are. At championship level, they'll do that during the playoffs. And I would I would imagine they might just need two or three goals over a, over both ties across the two legs. So yes, I would I would make Inverness my, my favourites for, for that. 
I think we have, have, we've missed a step. This is the, missed a step where we've not actually looked at the Premiership playoffs as well because uh, Airdrie and Partick Thistle, they were also both playing on Friday night. Obviously, they were playing Friday night. Every team was playing on Friday night. But uh, Partick Thistle lost 4-1 at Dundee United. Pretty straightforward win for, for the Arabs. I was, I was in the pub at the time, so I was half watching it. But I think that I mean, when the goalkeeper loses two goals between his legs, you just really know it's not going to be your night. I know that it was Thistle certainly played a fringe side. Obviously, Brian Graham was rested young. Uh, Rico Dayak was was playing up front, I, and I was I was looking at the record over the course of the season between Thistle and Airdrie, and it's broadly broadly the same. I know that Thistle won the last encounter four 0 but prior to that, had been a win apiece and a draw. Should you read much into previous form between the sides going into these games? Mm. I suppose it's a fair barometer to, to do. It. It's the only real barometer aye. you can you can use. Aye, it, it, it's, it's all you can go for. But I do think that the, I do think the players are like a kind of law into themselves. Mm. I, for what it's worth, I, I think Patrick Thistle will just sneak it. Uh, I, I really do. I think they're slightly better than 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 Airdrie. And I, I, I th- like we we kind of touched on it in the last podcast. I think where we said where Airdrie generally play well, but when they have a poor game, they have a bit of a stinker. Mm. You kind of saw elements of that against Queen's Park as much as they played a, a not a fringe side, but a, a, certainly a weaker side. And I, I just think that Paddock will be able to to, to get the better of them and it'll be they'll be Wraith uh, Paddock in the semis and then we'll, we'll take it for there. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's take a dip into League One just now. I suppose we'll start at the very top where Falkirk drew 2 2 with Aloe Athletic to maintain their unbeaten season. An absolutely incredible achievement. Falkirk FC, the Invincibles. However, I, I and I think the rest of the nation, when they saw that Aloe had taken a two goal lead through Connor Salmon, we were like, fucking yes, party time. <laughs> Here we fucking go. However, um, I think it was Aidan Nisbet uh, he scored just on the cusp of half time and then Brad Spencer got a late penalty to tie their match to each massive pitch invasion brilliant celebrations and just you've got to say once again fair play to Falkirk FC absolutely incredible season I think that pound for pound they have had the best season of any team in Scotland this season brilliant achievement yeah absolutely and uh, as much as we can last, I saw a comment uh, on, on Pi Bovel about how this might be one of the, the great achievements in Scottish football mm. history. And I was like, mm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about Aye. that, but regardless, <laughs> regardless, they've, they've been absolutely incredible. And you're right, when they went 2 up, when Alan went 2 up, I was like, mm, maybe just, maybe like the pressure is going to get to get to Fogger. The fact that Alan was like so relaxed and they, they can, there's no pressure, maybe they, they will be able to see at the game. But Fogger have come from behind yeah. so many times this season. Like, the, the, there was at no point where I thought, right, well, <laughs> That's it. The, see, I was going to win this. See, watching the highlights back, it was Nisbet scoring just in the stroke of half time, and I know yeah. that that completely ch- that it doesn't matter what the context. That will always change the complexion of a game. But there's just this inevitability about this Falkirk mm-hmm. team, and see when he scored, running with the ball back in the centre circle, and he's doing the thing with his arms. He's you know yep. he's, he's going whipping. to the going to the south stand, going to whipping the main stand, and whipping up. And I think that, that he just knew the fans just knew that that the goal was eventually coming, and I think that when Spencer scored that penalty, and, and think I'm not 100 percent sure if it was a penalty, that I think that I watched the the Aloha, I thought it was. I watched the Aloha highlights. I think that Aggie Man headed Andy Graham's arm into the ball. Did did maybe I just imagined this last night, but did Aloha's official Twitter no, feed they say it, it, it definitely wasn't a penalty. I, I thought that was, was quite pathetic. It, it was, I mean, that's that's all our Twitter for you, though, isn't it? Just uh, when the when the admin said one too many uh, shandies, he's he's online posting uh, screenshots, and we all know that a still image doesn't really tell the tell tell the full story. So just an absolute waste of time, and inevitably a lot of people, mostly Falkirk fans, jumped on top of it. But when Spencer scored, the noise from yep. the crowd that I think that's probably the loudest I've heard a goal celebrated. This season, it just it was just a it was just a, it was a terrific moment, and you could tell as well when the, when the final whistle was counting down into injury time. People were just desperate to get onto the pitch. I think that's one that one of the Allah commentators says. He said that the match is just getting in the way. Oh, keep people, up. I, the man, no, that's right. The was just getting. <laughs> I've edging, never seen that before. Edging further and further and further towards. I mean, there was boys who must have left the south stand to come on, like like to the half to, like, towards half like, How have these boys <laughs> go out and, and, and managed to sprint onto the pitch? But I think that it was just it was great to see, very cathartic, and and just had to get two pitch invasions in the over the course of a season. These are. I think this is not like the Dundee United pitch invasions that we've seen. This felt like a proper pitch invasion. I mean, the one against Montrose, 
that's when they beat them 7-1. What, I mean, they'd already won the league by that point, obviously, with Aki's losing earlier in the day. But that was just an incredible moment. You, you, you go away to a team who you've struggled against throughout your time in League One, and you just smash them up. You just absolutely brutalise them. Like, you know, in um, Mortal Kombat, like a fatality. You know, one of those ones where a character will rip off someone's head and stick it up their backside. That's what Falkert did to Montrose. I, I, and then, obviously, going unbeaten over the course of the season, that prompted their pitch invasion. So I can completely understand why they would have um, they would have done that. I mean, we've spoken on last week's podcast about Falkirk and their prospects for next season. We don't need to do that again. But I'll say about Alloa, though, it's when I saw the lineup for this game, I thought, Alloa are having a laugh here. It was Andy Graham's fourth appearance of the season. The last time he played was in, a, I think, a Challenge Cup tie against Rangers B back in September. So I think that, might, that could well be his last ever game as a as a professional as well. And when Jotucci Ogai, a goalkeeper who was once described as raw, a word I've never, ever <laughs> heard a, a goalkeeper u- used before, I thought that this is Alou or just them. Um, Alou, I've, I've let, much like Airdrie, they have got one eye on what's, what's coming up against the Ackies. Aye, and rightly so. Uh, rightly so. But, but regardless of that, that like... I kind of thought they, they, they dealt with it quite well. Like on another day, Falkirk with a one. Falkirk with a one, like quite comfortably. But other than maybe like down the wings, like I, I thought the fullback struggled. I thought Andy Graham in general, judging by the highlights, they seemed to have like quite a decent game. So I fair play to them. They, 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 they got a point at the Champions and protected their players for a far more important game uh, in midweek. So I, I fair play, fair play to Alan. Would, would, say, would say about Falkirk, because we, we spoke about them on, on last week's show, Falkirk could have had about five or six goals in this one. And just yep. the, the degree of profligacy there, mm-hmm. it's, they need a centre-forward for next season. I know that Ross McKeever started the game at centre-back. Obviously, that's needs must and, and fair play. It looked like he... Um, well, I mean, obviously, Connor Salmon scoring two goals, but uh, both from... One was a header, one was a... In fact, they were both headers, weren't they? In fact, the, the second one as well, was he was completely free inside the box. So maybe that's something that else they need. They need more defenders. <laughs> and they need another, <laughs> another centre forward. But I think that from the, the watching the, the Anon Athletic game, watching this match here, it's something that they, they need to look at. Gary Oliver isn't the, the answer. Ryan Shanley, certainly not the answer when you saw the misty he had in the, the second half when he pulled over the bar. And with Morrison just constantly creating chances for them, anytime the ball goes to him on that right-hand side, ball was getting chucked in, good balls getting chucked in, and they just need a, a higher calibre, a striker there to, to finish those chances if, if, if McKeever can't do it. But I've no doubt that, that John McGlynn knows this and will address that for next season. Just, uh, just saying Conor Salmon. Yeah, why not? Why not? Bring him home. Bring him home. Feed the fish and he will score. I'm not sure that Mikey McKenna's the answer, incidentally. I, I'm surprised at that. 33, part-time footballer. I, I, I think he's good. Don't get me wrong. But I, I am not sure that he is nah. what Falkirk need for, presumably what Falkirk are hoping to achieve next season. I, I mean, I, I was, I was really surprised when I, when I saw that. Really surprised, and I'm sure. But I think it might be you that tell me that that Falkirk will allow him to to train on certain days mm-hmm. so he can maintain his business. I'll be honest. I don't think Michael McKenna is good enough for that degree of indulgence at his age. Someone who's never played full time football before. I, I, I'm just, I'm, I, I'm not doubting the the caliber of how good a player he is. I would imagine he would have gone to like Spartans or someone like that, or East Fife, if he was to leave our broth. Not Falkirk. I think that's not quite what Falkirk are, are looking for. No, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm amazed. And considering, I, I, again, I, I think this Falkirk team is quite good. And I think if you put them in a the championship, they do okay. They still need two or three upgrades on, mm-hmm. on certain positions. But um, I, McK- McKenna will be, I, I presume McKenna will be a squad player. And even I, I would imagine that, that John McGlynn thinks he's going to be a squad player if the if if the, the thinking is that he'll be a, a, a kind of first team player week in week out. I, I, I might not be quite as confident about Falkirk's chances next season. Well, Aloha anyway are going to be playing against Hamilton Ackies. I'm going to try and make it at least make it to the second leg of this game at Hamilton. I think we've we'll watched the the Rangers Celtic game before that, and then head out to Hamilton, although I stay quite close to Celtic Park, so I will need to, to leave to beat the traffic. I don't know why I'm going through my logistics for, for next Saturday. <laughs> no one no one needs to know. I'm giving out assassination <laughs> coordinates as well, to quote Elon Musk. But, uh, I wonder, I'm terrified that um, 
that someone might, I, I won't say it because the person might be able to identify themselves, but Sean, you, you know you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> the, 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 point I was, the point I was going to make was just that, that Hamilton Ackies have had a, I suppose, a, a, like, a, I don't know if they've had a good season or not because ultimately they were supposed to try and win the league and they didn't. They, 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 when they, they stopped winning games, Falkirk didn't and were just able to, to keep on pushing on. But they did finish the season quite strongly at a 4 one win over Kelty Hearts. And I think what else is equally impressive, the club tweeted out that the 11 players that finished that match were all academy graduates, which is incredible. A lot of the guys have been at the club since age about nine or 10. So that's that's astonishing. That's a huge achievement for the club. How do you think they'll do against that lot? Because, of course, it's just popped into my skull that these teams played each other last year in the playoffs. And probably one of the, the daftest games... Yes. Uh, you Douglas Park, remind me, Aloha were cruising from, or, or Aloha had won the first leg, had gone two goals up in uh-huh. the, the second leg. The fans en masse turned to shout at the board, yep. but then Aloha went through an enormous, a ridiculous number of injuries in that match. They were already... Did, Stor- did George Stanger get sent off? George Stanger got off. sent off. Somebody got injured, so they, they were basically playing with Andy Graham and two teenage attackers <laughs> like either side of him. <laughs> And then Aki's just completely took the drawers off in the end. I think he won by five or something, like five two or yeah. something like that. So it's a, a rerun of, of of last season's semi final. How do you see how do you see this one going? I I think Hamilton won it just because I think Hamilton are a, Hamilton are a better team. I that said, I think Alawa's kind of front three could absolutely score goals. So if Alawa can can manage to keep Hamilton out, which I think I do think is easier said than done. Uh, so I'll have a chance but I do fancy Hamilton for, for, for this one what I am amazed about and I actually just they seem to pass me by but I only uh, discovered uh, maybe a couple of hours ago that they've given John Rankin a long term a new long term no deal no way no way have that they? was announced I think it was Friday or Saturday's announced and it's totally passed me by when, when did and I, I cannot believe that genuinely when, cannot believe that when was this I think it was I think it might have been Friday they've announced it like even like like, like, even if you can, like Hamilton, have, have, have got seventy. I think they've now got seventy odd points, which is a decent, I suppose, a decent tally. And a number of other seasons that would win you the league. So, so I get it. You could argue that they've had a decent season all told, but that Falkirk have just been absolutely incredible. But the playoffs are still to come. So even if you, even if you thought about ranking as somebody for the next one, two, three seasons, whatever it is, play the playoffs first and then make your decision based on that. So see, see, just because of that, like although I, th- I kind of thought that, that Hamilton wouldn't get promoted anyway, that, for me, has totally made up my mind. The fact they've given John Rankin a new long-term deal means that Hamilton cannot possibly get promoted. That's what the narrative uh, dictates. They haven't, or certainly, I, I can't tell, I'm on the, the Hamilton Ackies one, the Ackies FC one, the Twitter account that's described as, wait till I get to the top. This Twitter, a Twitter feed for Hamilton Academical FC News Info and Stats. So obviously we've got the, the two Twitter accounts. Maybe it was posted on the one that's got about 200 followers. I don't know, but that's extraordinary. That com- I completely missed that. And like you, Sean, I am very surprised by that. Let's wait till the end of the season and get the lie land. Are we going to be in the championship? Are we going to be in League One? Let's see what the situation is there before we start handing out these uh, these big deals. And I, I've, I've put in, I put my notes there that I would fancy Aki's to win this because ultimately they're a better team. They have shown that over the course of the season. There's something about John Rankin in the big games that you just can't quite put your finger on. And that is why I think that they, they, might, they might beat the Ackies, certainly, but I do think that Cali Thistle are going to be uh, too hot for them to, to handle. Certainly, they, they, I don't think they'll score against them, and I'm not sure they're quite good enough to, to keep them out at the, at the other end. So it'll be interesting to see how, how that one goes. So I think then we're both agreed Cali Thistle will win the championship playoffs. I think so, yeah. Okay, fair enough. We'll go then, Sean, to the bottom of League One and we'll go to Fourth Bank. This was, I think, for me, the biggest game of in the SPAFL of the weekend where Sterling Albion were taking on Annan Athletic. This was eighth place, sorry, this was ninth place versus eighth place. It was only goal difference separating the sides. Annan, obviously, with a superior tally. And effectively, Sterling Albion needed to win this match if they were to avoid the relegation playoffs. Sean, you were at this game. You yes. I said you took this one in. How did you get on? I uh, you know, I had a class day. Good. So Good. It's, it's a long time since I've been to Stirling. I so in terms of the in terms of the 42 SPFL stadiums, I think the longest 
I think Stirling is the the one I've been to in the most distant past. Right. I think maybe the playoffs might be in about two thousand and six. Maybe the last time I went. So I haven't really been to Stirling very much either. So kind of got train across. Uh, went to got there about one. Went to Molly Malone's. Was speaking to to Annan fans and and Alloa fans, uh, and there. There was an Alloa fan brought me a drink because they, they enjoyed the show. Uh, I was a wee bit grumpy because Che Adams was walking off with oh. a so I was worried about that. Then he brought me a drink and then we blared away. So suddenly I was I was, I was very much cheered up. In terms of uh, in, in terms of the kind of inside the uh, fourth bank itself, I thought Annan like brought a really really. Uh, kind of boisterous crowd. Stirling had like a, a, a good backing as well in terms of numbers, but certainly in terms of noise, it was it, it was Annan. Slightly unusually during the game, there was at two points there was uh, children sat down next to me. I was like, I don't really understand what, what's going on here. But the, the 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 second one that sat down next to me was maybe about six, five or six, and he was like, "Do you do you support Annan?" I was like, "No, I don't." I goes, but I am, I am hoping you win today. He goes, right, he goes, because I've heard that you're a famous YouTuber, so I thought I'd come across and speak to you. So okay. I kind of got the impression that maybe both the children that sat there next to me hoped I would interview them and then put them on YouTube. But of course, that, that didn't happen. So they were they were ultimately probably disappointed. Oh. But nevertheless, I thought, the, in terms of the game, I thought it was tense. Yeah, it looked, like it, was, a, it looked like a good game going by the highlights. It was, it absolutely was. It, it kind of swung. Like, I thought the first 20 minutes, I mean, obviously, Annan went ahead. Uh, four minutes and for the first maybe 20 25 minutes in terms of Tommy Goss leading the line Josh Walker playing behind them Benjamin Luison had a, a good game mm. playing behind them Smith kind of out wide was, was doing very well and I like you'd mentioned it last week in terms of you just expected Aaron to win this one because they have the momentum and they're a better team and you're absolutely right I, I think there's more players or there are players in this Aaron team that could probably play at a higher level no one tell sure about that if it comes to to Stalin Albion, if they have too many players that could that could do something similar. But but something changed, maybe kind of midway through the through the first half. Stalin started to get a, a foothold in the game. Really good goal for, for Josh McPake. Yeah, it was 10 lovely. minutes before half time. Lovely goal. Really, really good finish. And that made it that that made the second half much more tense. And as much as Stalin Albion had had all of the ball, uh, I know I know Dan Young and, and Peter Murphy, to be fair, I kind of said that the that, that Albion had very much dictated uh, the, the second period at the very least. But they never really, I, I never really got the impression that they were doing enough to, to get a winner or, or get that second goal. Greg Fleming had a couple of good saves, but it wasn't really, like, I, I thought defensively, Anna were very good. They kind of cleared everything, kicked, headed everything that, that kind of come their way. And to a degree, they kept still and Albion at, at arm's length. But you would probably argue that over the piece, still and Albion were, were the better side. But ultimately, over the last whatever it is, kind of third of the season, a quarter of the season, and then I've done magnificently. And and that that pitch invasion at the end, I, at like we're about two minutes to go. The, the Annan fans were starting to make their way down, and they were obviously getting ready to run onto the park mm-hmm. if they got the result that, that was required. And I was thinking to myself, like, could I could I run on here? <laughs> I was like, but ultimately, I'd, I'd just be running on so that I could be on the pitch. Like, I, I don't really have any any skin in the game, so I was like, no, I, I, I probably won't, and and I don't see how anybody could run on if I if I'm not really that fast. But then, see the the Alwa fan that bought me a drink in the pub before the game. At one point, I was watching the pitch invasion, and he was just running about, <laughs> running about like like going absolutely daft, like cuddling <laughs> and fans are just having that, an absolute wheel of a time. So he obviously had a different. A different opinion when it comes to pitch invasions uh, to myself, but I no, a really, really enjoyable day and and, and fair play to Annan. But if if still and Albion can play in these playoffs like how they did on Saturday, which is a different story, of course, but they, they'll give themselves every chance because actually on Saturday I thought they were decent. Well, luckily for them, they're coming up against a team whose manager also can't win big games. You're going to be taking on <laughs> Dumbarton, who finished in fourth place in League. Two, and this is actually sort of a, a rerun, kind of actually similar to um, Aloha Hamilton that we mentioned. This is a sort of rerun. Actually, it's nothing like those two games because they were different divisions. Scratch that. This is actually just a rerun of the battle at the top <laughs> of League Two last season because for the best part, it was a, a two-horse race to win the title between the Beanos and the Suns, and ultimately the Beanos just continued to win. 
and, and, and Dumbarton fell away. And there was that accusation uh, against Stevie Farrell. It's been something that he's experienced. Now, what, we're in his third season as the Dumbarton manager where, where he can't win the big matches. You know, they were relegated via the playoffs last season. They chucked it in the games against Stirling Albion. And then when they took on Annan in the playoffs, they, they turned in one of the all-time worst ever performances. And we're going into it again. And I, I, what I've seen from Dumbarton, Dumbarton are a team I quite like this season. I think that the constituent parts of the team, especially now that Mark Dernan is fit and playing again, I think that he just makes everyone around them better. But, but when it comes to these matches, I'm not 100% sure if you can trust a Stevie Farrell team. So I don't know how it's going to go. But this is the game I'm going to try and get to on Tuesday night. I was looking at the fixtures. This is perhaps the closest one for me to get to. So I might head along to the the rock for this one and sit in the it's sit in the home end. I'm definitely sit in the home end. Won't be won't be in their way in next to Sullen Albion fans. I'll tell you that for fucking nothing. I mean, hopefully uh, this will be one of the few Sullen Albion Dumbarton games that that doesn't get postponed with about five minutes. To I go. was like, thinking surely that there's going to be enough. Surely there's going to be enough rain I, to, to to put this one to, I, to to bed. I was thinking that I can imagine myself in the queue with my money in hand and getting a you know for. <laughs> For fuck's sake, coming along the back. And yes, there's a microclimate around the rock that has not only flooded the pitch, but also caused it to freeze at the same time, meaning this fixture is postponed indefinitely <laughs> and it'll never, ever go ahead. But no, I'm looking forward to this. And Sean, just one thing I wanted to ask you as well, because you mentioned this in the Terrace Podcast WhatsApp group chat. You saw the, the Sterling Young team in action. This is a group of young supporters what? who have been getting a bit yeah. of heat, I think. Mm -hmm off a number of, of, of supporters, certainly reading Pie and Bovril, it's a, a young gang that, that turn up outside Force Bank. They might have been banned in the 1945 crew, they might be called. Either way, there's a group of young supporters who have been causing havoc at Force Bank recently. And and you were caught in the eye of the storm. <laughs> I don't know about eye of the storm. <laughs> but just just a strange just a strange group of lads. So you know you know the big car park just outside uh Force Bank. So yes. I was kind of walking through there, going back towards the the kind of city centre to get the to get the train home, and I could see there was like pyro getting lit, and it's kind of red, uh, kind of smoke bomb going off. Absolutely fine, but I could see that some people were getting agitated, and and some people. So I don't know if if there'd already been some kind of interactions with them. I'm not entirely sure, but some people were already speaking to police and saying you need to be doing things about this. So when I was getting towards them, and you, you kind of get a better look of what the group consists of. So it was like maybe twenty to twenty five young guys. All aged between, or the majority of them, sorry, maybe aged between 12 to 16. And a lot of them looked like really nervous. Mm. Like as if they found it slightly unnerving. Uh, never mind anybody else uh, that, around them. Then, in amongst them, you had somebody who was slightly older, I think who was maybe 18 to, to 20, oh. off his chops. Absolutely off his chops. The way you're describing it, Sean, it reminds me of something out like Streets of Rage, like where there's all the young boys that you fight and then you get to them and there's a boss who's just bigger than everyone else's. Is that what you're saying? You're saying this guy was the street end of level boss? No, because there was two bosses oh! in this group. So you have you have the Rangers fan who's off his chops on uh, narcotics, clearly, oh. uh, and a, a bottle of Buckfast. He was he was just screaming about how much he wanted to fight people. Fuck I was like, hell. this is a, a really weird situation. But then even odder is that in amongst them, uh, or also in amongst them, you had a guy that was maybe... They're not that much younger than me, like maybe <laughs> early forties, and he seemed to be like he seemed to be directing them. Like he seemed to be saying, "Right, we need to go here. Right, let's stop doing that. Let's go over here now." Fucking and he was wearing like hell. the big, the big kind of bomber jacket type of thing. And it's like, right, a the guy in the ranger ship needs to to lay off the class A's, and the guy that's in charge here needs to start palling about with people that are the same age as him. Oh. A, a very very strange group of people. And then maybe maybe I'm just naive, and and this happens at a number of stadiums. But I've never I've never seen that before. That's that, that, that that's extraordinary. I didn't realise that they were being coordinated by a man old enough to be their fathers. Maybe it is one of the kids' fathers. We don't know. And that's his two sons, the bigger one and one of them is the younger ones. But I've been, I've been read in Pine Bovril that these guys are just a nuisance now. I think everyone at the club's fed up with them. I think that when you get a young team in like that, you want to. You want to indulge them to a certain degree and perhaps they might get away with things that other supporters wouldn't, like bad language, for instance, and, and perhaps letting off the odd flair. But there does come a point where you need to say enough's enough. You're, you're painting the club in a bad light. You're making this an unpleasant atmosphere 
for other supporters to come to, especially at Fourth Bank, where I know from watching the highlights, they'd opened up the, the sort of the uncovered terracing behind one of the goals, and there was the, a flare out there, which was, was very impressive. But when that's not the case, and it's just the one stand that's open, then that behaviour can get really grating because there isn't really anywhere else for, for, for you to go, you know? No, there was like so much good stuff happening on Saturday. And, and, like, I, had, I had a really good afternoon, to be fair. Good. But I, it, was, uh, there, there, it, was, it was a wee bit of a sour note, I suppose. The, the other League One playoffs, that's going to be contested by the Spartans and Peterhead. The Spartans beat... Who did the Spartans beat? I've not even written it down. But East Fife. East Fife, that's right. That's an East Fife side who are there. They're a team who have definitely checked out. I think they've lost their last four matches, am I right in saying? Yeah. Uh, possibly, yeah. They, they, ever since, essentially, they lost to... Uh, was it Burnerig? Like yeah. That ultimately was, that was the end of their kind of promotion push. So, yes, they're very much down tools since then. Yeah, so that, that's what happens when you make Bonnerig look like 1970s Brazil. Your, team's, <laughs> your season just completely implodes into, into a black hole. Uh, and fair play to Bonnie Rigg as well. That's a what a way to round off the season there yep. with a, 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 absolutely smashing up for for Athletic. And I'm I'm really interested to see what they do this season. I mean, there's under Calamelli a very small sample size, but I mean they've only lost to the Spartans. That's the only game they've lost out of six games that he's been in charge. Fair play. Thought it was a strange roll of dice, or, or not a strange roll of dice, but a desperate roll of dice at the time. But ultimately, it is turned into a, a really, really good piece of business. And, and if he is able, I think they've signed Sean Murphy from Trinet. They've agreed terms with him. Mick Kennedy on Twitter, you know, when he's, when he's not slagging off managers that he's worked <laughs> against, he says that, that Sean Murphy's a, a very good player and one of the best like bop screening midfielders in part-time football. So he looks like he could be a really good signing for them. So i very keen to see what Callum Elliott and Bonnie Rigg do going forward. I mean, Mick Kennedy's saying that, but he's also... Like he hasn't signed them this season, and he's signed about three hundred and twelve players. So maybe, maybe in terms of his uh, what he says and, and his actions, don't quite uh, don't quite marry up. Yeah, aye, aye. But I mean, never, nevertheless, he's the only person who's offered opinion about Sean Murphy. So I'm going to have to sort of take it at face value. <laughs> so so fair, fair, fair play to him, fair play to him. But no, no, uh, Spartans against Peterhead and the matches they've actually played each other five times already this season. They met in the League Cup group stages right at the beginning of the campaign. Spartans have won three of those games. Peterhead have won one. They've drawn the other one. Very even between the games in them. How do you see this one? Actually, I think this is a really difficult one to call. This is perhaps of all the fixtures, this is perhaps the, the trickiest. I, I, I just think in terms of these playoff games, there, there are two teams that kind of feel like they've, they've just run out of puff the last quarter of the season. And that's, uh, that, that I know Spartans are a good win uh, the weekend and, and beat Bonnie League uh, a, couple weeks, uh, a couple of weeks before that. I I just think that, that Peterhead and Dumbarton will be the two teams that uh, pro- progress to the final. I, 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 yeah, I, I just think uh, it's still in Albion and, and Spartans. Started the season very, very well. Yeah. Very impressively, actually. Uh, surprisingly so. But no, I, I don't think either of those will be in the, it'll be in the final and it'll be Dumbarton and Peterhead. Oh, okay. I, I'm going to agree with you. I think it's going to be Dumbarton, Peterhead in the, the final as well. And then out of those two teams, who is going to get promoted then into League One? I, I will go for Peterhead. Okay. I, I, I cannot trust Stevie Farrell at all. You, so can't, you can't trust Stevie Farrell. Even, even if I was a, an Olympian who was good at the javelin, I still couldn't trust him as far as I could throw him. <laughs> I'm going to imagine as well that Stevie Farrell weighs a lot heavier than a javelin and he's got different dimensions to a javelin so he will ultimately be more difficult to throw but nevertheless It's certainly a a, a more difficult technique Yeah, you need two hands really I mean, imagine trying to throw a man with one hand (laughs) Just imagine like Stevie Farrell like going head first but maybe like, I don't know, the 20 yard line or something (laughs) I'm just imagining you you probably go like a yard before he just immediately falls (laughs) That's, it. that's maybe that's something they should look to bring into it. Do you know that that seems like something they'd have in like a sort of weird Highland games where like throwing a man. That's that's what it looks like. Like throwing a man contest. There's like a like the a, a, the oldest man in the village gets thrown by all these young boys. I don't know. That sounds like a terrible idea. You would throw the oldest man. He'd, he'd like his heart would pick it. Or the the, the tallest man in the village. <laughs> I, don't, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but one of those weird villages that's in right in the northwest of Scotland. One of those weird ones, yeah, it's sort of like well past, well past Ullapool. Well, one of those weird ones as well. 
where it comes to annual event where the tallest man in the village, he's like barricades himself in his house. Then all the children kick his doors down. The village elders take him away and he gets chucked around for a, for a ceremony. Something to think about. Listen, if you're one of the producers of The Wicker Man, do get in touch with me because I've perhaps got something <laughs> that may be right up your alley. Some folk horror. Let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. Good film, The Wicker Man, isn't it? Very good film, The Wicker Man. Have you seen The Wicker Man? Have you seen The Wicker Man? Yes, I have. Yes. Uh, I've, I've, seen both, I've seen both versions oh, of The Wicker Man. The one where uh, Nicolas Cage is forced to wear an iron mask and says, not the bees. Like, it's like something that he <laughs> yes. experiences. One of those extraordinary few minutes of cinema. <laughs> yeah, it's like something he's experienced loads of times. Oh, not the bees. Where someone, if I if I was wearing a mask full of bees, I'd be absolutely terrified. But he he sells it like it's some sort of like minor inconvenience. A, a really weird, uh, just a really weird a scene to add in. Like if you're yeah. going to remake a film, why have you just added in this bit about bees? Like this, that this was not uh, included in the first uh, film. Well, well, no, no, no. The whole point though of the Wicker Man remake wasn't it that the the bees were failing. And that is why they need. They wanted the human sacrifice to come in. Very I, much I, so. I just, I just thought it was an odd, an odd scene to add in. No, uh, it made sense. It made sense within the context of the movie. It's just it was very poorly directed. And and imagine you're the scriptwriter who's writing in there, not the bees. You. Some, Nicholas Cage is a terrible actor, to be fair. Ah, like, fuck really off. Bad. Fuck off. He's got he's got an Oscar for for leaving Las Vegas. So uh-huh, fair play right. to that. Conair's excellent. Conair is an enjoyable romp. Exactly. Nicholas Cage, is, Nicholas Cage is terrible in every film he's ever no, in. No, 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 no. Come on. Conair's a great movie. Yes, I know it's a great mm-hmm. movie, but Nicholas Cage is bad in it. He's not bad in it. He gives a. He, he's very camp in it. Like he's, put the bunny in. Put the bunny in the box. Terrible. Yep. Uh, why don't you put the bunny back in the box? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think he's great. I watched it. I mean, I mean talking to Fowler about this. It's something that you don't tend to do much in the streaming age, whereby if a movie's on the television, you'll just watch it halfway through because a lot of the time you just spend time going through Netflix and Amazon Prime mm-hmm. trying to find something. But a couple of a couple of weeks ago, I was just flicking through the television and Corn Air started. It was about 20 minutes into it. And so it was the bit where the plane's just taken off. And I was like, fucking yes. <laughs> and, and watching it back, I was I reminded myself how much I love this movie. It's absolutely ridiculous. Every single scene is absolutely ridiculous, but it's it, it's great. It's absolutely great. And as I'm looking into this, I might, I'm looking, my eyes are quite puffy. Uh, do you see these flabby bits under your eyes here? You might get a, right. a facelift. Right, okay. You get a facelift. Do you know this is good, like you're, you're maybe hungover and, and have the cold? No, I'm not hungover, but I do have the cold. And the reason that I have the cold is because I was at Stranraer 2 Stenhouse Muir at the weekend. It was a huge game at the bottom mm. of League 2. Clyde were taking on Elgin City. Stranraer were taking on Stenhouse Muir. There's a two-point gap between the sides. However, both teams won. Clyde beat Elgin 3-0. Stranraer beat the Warriors 2-0. And that means that it's the Blues that will contest the League 2 playoffs against East Kilbride. Sean will come on and talk about my fantastic day down in Wigtonshire very shortly. If you thought this was a lot, if you thought last week was the last time we we're going to be talking about Stenny, you are bang wrong because you're going to get a wee bit more of them now. But we'll talk about Elgin Nils Clyde 3. There weren't many highlights to go by. There was only really no. the, the club just tweeted out the goals. But nevertheless, a brilliant, brilliant win for, for Clyde. And that's them in the League 2 for another season. Uh, very, very comprehensive. Uh, I, I did enjoy in the, the, the goals that they tweeted out. I just, like, I, you can potentially miss it, but just right at the back of the, the first goal when they, when they went a goal up, it kind of cuts to the, the fans mm-hmm. and a Clyde fan falls over the, the advertising. Yeah, home. and it's just like what we were saying about the Queen's Park highlights. Why did you move the camera? <laughs> I wanted to see this big bald fella who's keeled over the wall. I wanted to see him being brought, being hoisted up by his friend and hauled back over the wall. Why did you cut that out? But yeah, that was a bit, so we're about five frames. And then that's it. It's just like, you need to rewrite, like, what happened there? And you get to, you get the chance to see it again. But two goals by Liam Scullion. And, and just, just as a, a side note, did, did anything ever happen with Liam Scullion and the, the Bonnie Rigg incident? Was he ever banned for, for a, a period? Was it not like a one or two game ban and that was it? 
I'd, I expected more considering what it consisted of, but no, I think it was just a game uh, or two. Fair enough. I, I didn't expect to see him play again this season, so fair play. And I think he has latterly been one of Clyde's better players. Certainly, Ian McCall is really getting a tune out of him. And the forwards like like Martin Rennie looked like he had a really good game here. He just set up one of the goals, scored the, the third one to put a tin lid on it. I very impressed from 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 Clyde here, and slightly disappointed from Elgin because I haven't seen Elgin earlier in the season. In fact, earlier in the season, just a couple of weeks ago, I thought they were really good. I thought they were the kind of team that could really cause Clyde some problems. That didn't appear to be the case. We've got a small, not not much to go on. We've got like ninety seconds of of goals that, that were posted onto the Clyde's Twitter page, but nevertheless, impressive achievement. I and and you know something, I wouldn't be surprised if from this point they do. Something similar to Montrose. Uh, I remember Montrose was involved in that very first kind of relegation playoff. Uh, was it Broder they beat? Yes. Uh, over over two legs. And then since then, they've, they've kind of went on to, to bigger and better things. I'm not necessarily saying that Clyde will, will go on to, to have the same kind of impact that, that Montrose do in terms of being there or thereabouts for the, the, the kind of championship playoffs every year. But I also wouldn't be surprised if Clyde are, are one of the, the teams that you fancy for, mm. for promotion next season. We'll see what happens with we and McCall. You obviously have the situation in... Uh, with the Queen of South oh, where of course. Marvin Bartley we... this, this had his, his services disp- the dispensed maybe McCall would, would be mm. a name in contention for that and maybe Peter Murphy as well who uh, I has saw, done well at, at Annan I did I saw those names mentioned in Pine Bolver and I actually put down in my notes which I haven't referred to at all that that was something <laughs> worth discussing there about Marvin Bartley finally being re- removed as the, the Queen of South manager and I suppose it's not really a surprise it is shocking, but it's shocking for perhaps the wrong reasons. The fact that it took this long. They were playing Montrose at the weekend, 2-0 up, ultimately chucked away, lost the game 3-2. And after the think after the match, must be like a, an hour, half an hour or so, mm-hmm. after the game, they put up a website that, saying that, that he'd been moved on. I don't think anyone's surprised at this decision. And judging by social media and Pine Bovril, a lot of Dunhamers are quite happy with it as well. In fact, not quite happy, ecstatic with it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them are finding this the, the highlight of their season. Uh, I, I mean, I, I kind of was like, I kind of was surprised, but only because of the timing of it. Like, see if it had happened from like any month between November and March, you wouldn't right, Well, that's fair enough mm-hmm. because Queen of South have been so poor this season. But like, it had I think he got a two and a half year deal when he was initially brought in, and I'd I'd just kind of I don't know I don't know if resigned myself is the is the best expression to use. But I'd just presume that he would be there next season. Mm-hmm. Like, because if you, if you hadn't already got rid of him, like, why would you? Why why are you allowing yeah. him to, to, to stick around? I, uh, but no, no. I mean, it's the ultimately, unfortunately, the correct decision. Yeah, I think when it was mathematically confirmed that they could not finish in the top four, I thought that would have been the time to make the change and, and bring someone else in and try and. I mean, Marv Barlett ultimately kept in the division, but that's a. That's a very, very... Ah, you're making the face, so that's a very, very low bar there to, for, for success. And they finished seventh of the season, am I right in saying that's where they finished? If I was to check, give me a wee second, I've got the... I'm going to check Scottish League 2. I don't like checking stuff when we're on the calls because I think it's, it's just, let's just give it a go. Seventh place, yeah, so there you go. They have equaled Dunfermline and being the worst full-time team in the... In Scottish football, so that's mul- mul- fair play. That's, yeah, fair play. Hugely embarrassing, but it just feels like a totally wasted season for the club, and they're going to be um, again another club that are going to have to have a massive reset this season Nick, in, in the summer because uh, not to not to talk about Queens, we want to go on and talk about Stranraer, but you're 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 in such a, a pool to try and sign players, and, and you don't have a lot of money. You, a lot of fans will have been turned off. If you're going to have to sign younger players, you're probably going to be in the same problem that, that you're in again. Although I did feel, though, that the, the Queen's squad was really, really big and they didn't really have value for money for, for the guys that they had. Why not just have, like, 19 players that you can really trust and you can yeah. really form a bond with rather than saying, like, 25 players and who most of them will never, ever get used? It doesn't make sense to me. But I, I'm sorry that it didn't work out with Marvin Bartley because I did have high hopes for him. And every time we talk about Marvin Bartley, we're obligated to say we have met him we have spent time with him he's great company I really like him as a guy I, I do and I hope he is, uh, can bounce back and experience success elsewhere but ultimately 100% the, the right time well not the right time the right time would be a couple of months ago but the right decision uh, for him and for the club as they, they keep yeah. on forward and I I actually think that this experience has been Kind of so poor in terms of the, the results that he's he's managed to achieve and, and probably been so 
kind of damaging to him, mm. both in terms of like it must have just been like a kind of certainly the last whatever is nine months must have been very very difficult to the degree that I'm not entirely sure he'll be offered too many positions after this, and I'm not entirely sure that he would be necessarily open to to accepting any if if he got them. I, I would imagine he'll go back to coaching, which is he had a decent reputation as uh, a re- decent reputation for. I'd be surprised to see him as a manager again. Yeah, I can imagine him going back to Livingston for their, mm. for their time in the championship. I could see David Martindale taking him on. But I think one of the things I found interesting, maybe it was because of the, the level that he was coaching, sorry, level he was managing at, there didn't really seem to be a lot of scrutiny about it. I really think that perhaps a view from the terrace, and we only did it the once because we're not interested. I mean, just a wee peek behind the curtain. If When we talk about something in a view from the terrace, it's something it's something needs to change for us to want to go back and revisit it. Mm-hmm. So we spoke about Marvin Bartley and the situation there, and it's the show's not a news show, you know, so it's not just to keep reporting on the same things that have happened or just update situations. It's like, let's talk about a team who are really struggling and let's look at the, the different scenarios. So that's why we, we never really discussed Marvin Bartley. Nevertheless, we this podcast and, and that show were, were one of the few things we'd actually talk about Marvin Bartley, and obviously neither has a, a massive reach so that's perhaps why there wasn't the same degree of scrutiny in it. He could point, if he wants to get back into management, there's ways you can spin it, that he took over a team that were struggling at the time when he came over, a team that were circling the drain, and he kept them up and did the same thing again under difficult circumstances, reduced budgets. I'm saying this, Sean, you're making the face. This is how it might be spun. That's how, <laughs> that's, that's how it could be spun. I mean, he could try and spin it. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, how on earth could any... Kind of board of directors be be fueled by that spin. Then I remember that Wraith Rovers uh, appointed Gary Locke. So you know something, anything, anything's possible. There anything's you possible. go. I mean, I'm surprised you use Gary Locke example. Claudin Elka is always the, <laughs> the example. Part time DJ, part time football manager, full time legend. What a guy! What a guy! What a what a what a remarkable a remarkable time. I'd really like to think that a view from the terrace do something uh, about that. They're really good at, at going into the past and and making these short six or seven minute videos. They really need to go back and they really need to track down Herva Banda. That's what they need to do. Track down Herva Banda and interview him. I want to find about the time he approached Gordon DL and asked if he could paint the offices. That's that's something that we really need to find out more about. But we'll go, Sean, we'll go to Stair Park where Sinrar defeated Stennis Muir 2-0. Um, a goal in the, the first half from... Who was it? It's James called? Dolan. James, Do- James Dolan was excellent. James Dolan had a brilliant yep. game here. Goal in the first half from James Dolan and then Ryan Edgar, young boy who thinks he's just been on the fringe of the team, scored uh, midway through the second half. Sonrar were excellent. Stennis Muir were garbage here. Absolutely garbage. And anything, Sean, you want to ask about the match, now's your opportunity. We'll turn. I, I normally host these things. You can host and you can ask me questions about it if you want. L- listen, result aside, what about your day? That like, uh, Watch the highlights. There was a point where you see you uh, dressed in the crowd as Kane. Somebody is putting in on a Norwegian hat with two uh, kind of horns sticking out of it. Bearing in mind how cold Strunvar is, if you wanted to, to go to the game dressed as a wrestler, do you wish you'd you'd picked maybe the Undertaker who would wear a coat? Somebody already was going to the Undertaker, so <laughs> <laughs> it was a good effort though. Like everybody looked very, very good. It was it was the it was incredible fun. It was incredible fun. It's been a lot of fun following the Warriors this season. And I think that Strenard, given its distance and, and the fact that it's a long trip, it was agreed that we would all dress up for the occasion. And straight away, it was like going as a wrestler because they're always good fun to, to go as. And I chose Kane, the big red machine, the devil's favourite demon, because he's very distinctive looking. I've got the hair to pull it off, so yes. I don't need to worry about that. It's a mask and it's a it's a big morph suit almost. And, and I've got to say, like my, my, my muscles did look very oh, yes. impressive in it. That's something that I, I thought was pretty good. So that was great fun. There was a boy, and I love the highlights. This is, this is what makes Stranraer's highlights so good. There was a boy dressed as a shark. And you, just, <laughs> <laughs> and you just see him walking back for getting a pie as this big inflatable shark. <laughs> but then at that point, like, Brian, I'm, I'm presuming that Brian Martin is trying to do the... Da-da. Yeah, like the jaw, but he gets it all wrong. <laughs> I 
wondered what he was doing. I was like, that's not the Jaws I remember. It just goes. Maybe it doesn't really make any sense. No, he's doing the bit. He's just skipping straight to the bit when the shark is coming towards you. He's no interested in doing the bit. There's a. That's the only bit he's interested in. But the funniest bit, the funniest bit, and I don't know if the highlights caught this. You may have seen some photos that have been doing the rounds on social media. One of the boys went dressed as the Grim Reaper. Have you, did you see this? Big, yes. big Davy Scott went dressed as the Grim Reaper. Davy Scott's about six foot eight, right? He has he's present. He's got presence. When you see this boy, you know he's in the room. He's got presence, and he had the big black gown and he had this plastic scythe with him. He was, <laughs> was like, right. Like, so we were standing in this in the bit. We're all singing. And he was like, right, I'm way over at the home dugout. And so he ambles <laughs> and he's moving so slowly because he's, and it's just the way he's doing it because it's like the breeze is catching his, um, is catching his gown. And he just ambles over to the home dugout, gets his scythe out and just points it at Scott Agnew. <laughs> That's all he's doing. He's just standing stock still, pointing the scythe at Scott Agnew. And then there's these, there's these kids that are playing with a drum like so the the way it is at Stair Park at the moment, so the, the wee grandstand that they've got there, like there's about a sixth of the seats have been taken out. I presume that that area is getting renovated, but there's these kids have got a drum and there's about five or six of them they're trying to create an atmosphere. But then they see the monster and you just see them stopping playing the drum to go around and throw stuff at him. <laughs> and then then he uh, then, then he just comes back around the ambles and he's, he's very, very funny. And then he went around a second time midway through the, the second half, and a police officer told him to move. He wasn't doing anything. He wasn't doing anything. He was just standing, pointing his scythe at the home dugout, and a police officer told him to move. Honestly, I man. Mean, I mean, you say he's not doing anything. He's he's dressed as the Grim Reaper, and he's pointing his plastic scythe at people. That, I suppose that's quite threatening. Just, but the, the, you've got, his civil liberties have been infringed on. I don't want to get... <laughs> listen, I don't want to sound like a sovereign citizen here, but he he wasn't doing anything. He was just standing. He was just, just trying to create an atmosphere. But what I would say, man, is that that was very funny. But the Stennis Muir fans were absolutely superb. We, we sang pretty much the entire match. Sang on the bus down sang all through the game and then, then sang on the way back up. But having dressed as a wrestler, like I, I, we're in this outdoor pub. I was big, the, the cold was really beginning to, to bite me. The cold was really beginning to bite me. But the point, like I, I had one pint and then I was like, like basically I'm, I'm, I'm too cold. I'm, I'm focusing on how cold it was. Bef- the bus had parked outside Stair Park. I went back to get my jacket, but it was locked. So it was like, fuck me, I'm going to have to cut around like cane for the, for the rest of this journey. Yeah, uh, and and then so watch the game. Steny were terrible. Sonar were really good. And then as soon as I got back in the bus, put my jacket on and woke up with a cold. So you can maybe hear it in my voice. My nose is bunged up. I'm a wee bit, a wee bit of head cold as well. So I am not firing on all cylinders. But football was terrible. But what a great day and what a great way to to wrap up uh, an excellent season for the club. Is there is there anything from this game that that Stranraer can take in terms of building? positively for this mm. two-legged tie against East Kilbride that's coming up right. uh, for the next two Saturdays. Now, I'm going to look at it from, from a Stennis Muir perspective here because Stennis Muir were very much in having a laugh territory. They're, they're playing with a back three at the moment. That doesn't suit them. So now we're very, able to exploit it very easily, particularly James Dolan was able to get right in behind the, the wing back and the, the, the full back. He, he, he was excellent all match. And w- without Nat Wedderburn in the middle of the park, Mikey and James Berry had a pretty poor game. He started off in centre midfield, then he moved to right back and he was poor in both roles. And I, I kind of wonder if he is good enough to take mm-hmm. up into to, to League One next season. And I want to say it's not a slight on the guy personally because I've met him. He's a class guy, really, really nice guy, really enjoy his company. It's just, I'm just putting my, my objective team hat on here. Uh, I, but the, there was things like Stranraer won a lot of the first balls, but they won pretty much every second ball. The first half was quite even, and Stenny had a, a couple of chances. Bradley Rodden, again, nah. Bradley, a nice enough guy, not good enough for not, not good enough for League One with Aloha, not good enough for League Two. I don't think. I think it's perhaps best for all parties if he's moved on in the summer. I know he's got a year left on his deal, but I think he's Lowland League player, maybe. And that sounds. I don't like saying that, but that's that's certainly of all, all the evidence he's been at Stenny, not not good enough. Putting a cross for Matt Aitken to score at Bonnie Rig, though, so that was good fun. 
But they, but but nobody played. The only guy that played well, Curtis Lyle, the goalkeeper, had some good saves. Kinley Billum played all right. But in the second half, Sonar just won everything. They won all. Steny couldn't pick a man. Could he pass the ball ten yards? Everything that that went forward was gobbled up by Sonar. They were hungrier. They were more aggressive. There was something really at stake for them, and they, they must have known that that the the Clyde. Because some Steny fans, not myself, because I would never join us, they started singing "Bully Wee, Bully Wee, Bully Wee" when when Clyde had gone to not. Yeah, that was my face as well. Saying I'm not oh. saying I'm not singing Clyde songs. I'm no. not singing Clyde songs here. Um, but they must have been aware of it. So, like, even when Edgar scored, they took the ball at the back of the net and put it down because if something maybe had happened up at Borough Briggs, they might have had the they, they could have cha- they could have done something about it. But it's when you come up against a team who have nothing to play for, that are trying stuff out, injured players didn't travel. It was didn't have a lot of players on the bench. Very much a, a much changed squad. Steny, they're going on holiday on Thursday. I, I think they're away to Benidorm. I would say that Stranor were really, really good, but Steny and were very much weren't trying all that hard. And I know that you don't want to finish the season with a lose. Steny have finished the season with 68 points. Doesn't look all that impressive. But I job done for Steny. Like the job's been done pretty much since beating Bonnie Rig, like at the in that fight that, that game back in March. But that that's it. I mean Steny, not to not to talk too long about them because this this section isn't about them. But I, I do think that that's now two months without a win. That's an entire quarter without a win. Eight draws and a defeat. When you see performances like that, and yes, you've got to put them into context given how the rest of the season's gone. It does seem churlish to complain. If it was Gary Naismith, I would think we're probably looking at about five or six good players for next season. We really need to upgrade what we've got there if we want to challenge. Because there's the two teams that went up, still in Albion and Anna Athletic, both struggled. Mm-hmm. Both struggled yeah. next season. Oh, totally. And, and, and you're right, like, churlish to, to, to complain. But ultimately, you've, you've probably won the league in March. Yeah. Do you kind of understand how... You've kind of drifted to, towards the end of the season, but but, is, but, but there's uh, the thing, Sean. As a concern, if, if if most of this squad are signed up for next season, and you can't get the better of quite literally the worst sides in the SPFL, there's Stranraer, Clyde, Bonnie Rig, like lost to Stranraer, John John McClyde, like chucked away, or beaten Clyde, lost it, beaten Bonnie Rig, lost it, beaten Elgin, lost it late on. So the, the players' minds are are perhaps elsewhere. Nevertheless, like. If Stranraer can show the same, it was a terrible game of football as well. I have to say that, terrible game of football. Just like the ball went long an awful lot of the time. No one was really prepared to put their foot on it and, and drive forward. But if Stranraer can show that same fight and that same aggression, then they've got a chance. They've got a chance. But they need to, they need to, be, they need to be right up for it. And I hope they are. I hope they are. I, I think so as well. I, I, and, I, and I think they will be. I suppose my problem is I, I, I haven't really seen... He's got very much like I've watched their highlights like a few times. So, so literally all I know of them is kind of going through the squad and as much as they're clearly the best team in the Lona League, judging by that, by the names certainly that I recognise in that squad, I, I, don't, I don't know if they're that good. Mm. But then by the same token, I've said this last season about Albion Rovers and yeah. Spartans, for example. So I, I hope, listen, I hope Shinra do it. I... Considering it's a team that have struggled so much this season, I, I do have my doubts, and I, I think that I think it'll be close. I, I do think East Kilbride might have enough about them to to see Stranraer off, unfortunately. And and I think I think a big issue if, if that was to be the case, the fact that Stranraer is kind of so isolated, mm. how do you attract players to come yeah. to Stranraer when you're playing in the lower league? I think it'll be very tough. So I do. I, I, I hope Stranraer do it, but I I have my doubts. Yeah, one thing to point out though that East Kilbride haven't played a game since the twentieth of April. That was when they finished up the Lowland League with a win over Trinent. So they might be a little rusty. They might not have the rhythm of games. And there's Stranraer just turned in a really good performance against the champions. They should be buoyed by that. But I was looking a lot of the time we when we have this discussions about the team and the SPFL and and and, and League Two and so on. We always come at it from an SPFL perspective and we think, oh, it'd be terrible to lose a team with the tradition that let's turn our have and it's a great away day and it's a nice town and the the highlights package is so well put together and we like Brian Martin and we like Lawrence Nelson and so on. The crowd, the Sonar crowd wasn't all that impressive for such a big game. It wasn't. You look at the grandstand there, plenty of empty seats there. There was people sort of standing around the sides and round the back of the goals, but the town didn't really come out for them. And if if people aren't coming out to to follow this team, do they deserve? S- not saying deserve, deserves the wrong word, but where it's like 
we, what am I trying to say here? The points, I was reading the thread in Pine Bovro, and it was very interesting where they said, like, oh, it'd be terrible to lose a team like Stranraer. But then they've had the protection, and then could lose, that was it, lose a team like Stranraer and a team like East Kilbride who have come up that have been sort of like, like had steroid injections given the fact that the, their owners are really keen to put money into them. And, they've been, and, and to be fair, the owners have consistently put money into them. It's not just like, oh, we'll do it for a season, didn't get into the SPFL, and then they withdraw the funding. They've been putting a lot of money into it, and you can see by some of the names that they've signed over the past five or six years. And Sonora have perhaps been protected by SPFL money. That's given them an advantage that they wouldn't perhaps have had. The the sponsorship money that comes in from the governing body, that allows them to, to build a team. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's I'm, I'm a bit more... Maybe a bit more sanguine about it, having read that thread, and maybe I've just been looking at it from a very one-eyed perspective. There is there is no getting away from the fact that as one of the the more poorly supported SPFL sides that Stranraer will, unless something can turn around in the next kind of season or two, they will always be there or thereabouts, probably. Unless getting very much kind of punch above their weight. If if you're averaging whatever it is, three hundred and fifty punters a fortnight, you will be one of the poorer sides in in the SPFL. It's as simple as that. I, I suppose. What I'm where I'm looking at it from is, and to be fair, I'm sure you're exactly the same. It's like just where I'd rather go. Like, would I rather go to Steer Park or would I rather go to a glorified five side pitch, which it kind of looks like mm. is what K Park is? Yeah. And I'd very much rather be going to Stranraer. Yeah. Yeah. That's it as well. And on top of that as well, I think that there's some people don't particularly like Mick Kennedy. That's I I've met McKenna every time we bring up piece where I say McKenna I've met I think he's really good company when he did he was classing a view for the terrace and he, I find him a really interesting guy I'd go for a pint with him I've met him in a restaurant just around the corner from me but I think that he, the way he kind of conducts himself on social media can put people's backs up the wrong way but same with the guy who does the the graphics and so on for 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 East Kilbride he comes across doesn't come across particularly well either they put out a graphic about it actually wasn't that bad it was like the some it was somebody tuning in to watch like a a hot on a holiday tuning in to watch like Stranraer uh Stennis Muir and Mick Moore who played you've, you've nicknamed Mr Stranraer scored over 100 goals for for the Blues he had put something saying like the arrogance of this club's unbelievable hope you get pumped something along those lines and the guy replied to it saying I think you're reading too much into it but then again, this is the same guy who tried to trail that they had David Goodwillie signing for them and, and said it, and said, Oh, you guys are reading too much into it and you knew exactly what you were doing there. So I think that's what puts people off against East Kilbride. But I mean it's ultimately you, you if you want it's, it's something though, Sean, like I believe I want to believe in the pyramid and and that, that if it's teams that you like, if it's teams you like that that go down. Then, then tough. If you want the pyramid, you got to think of the greater good. If you want, if you want it to function and you want it to flourish, then that's what has to happen. And I, I'd prefer it if it was like Stirling and Albion or Clyde that, that, that were going down instead of the team, the teams like Snor. But ultimately, it's bigger picture stuff. Said it tons of times. Said it tons of times. We need change the way that promotion and relegation between the SPFL and other divisions works. That's need to do it. And I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you do that. And in defence of McKennedy, that man can cook a chicken. Fucking hell, man. I quite fancy a little bit of peri-peri. Uh, that might sort this cold out. That might <laughs> sort this cold out. The loaded fries. Say what you like, man. The loaded fries that they sell at Black Rooster are absolutely superb. Never been. No, Never it's, been. it's class, man. Think so. It's class, man. The food, the food's excellent. The chicken burgers, the, the peri-peri sauce, the spice is, is, is very, very good. Especially if you've uh, been out the night before. That's the sort of stuff that will that'll absolutely straighten your head out. So highly recommended. But hopefully, I was thinking about being able to get to uh, East Kilbride Stranraer. That's next week. And I'm going to imagine the capacity at K Park's very small. I'm going to be its old ticket, and I don't think it's fair that that someone pitches up who doesn't have an affiliation with either club. So let the East Kilbride fans and the Stranraer fans go there first. That's it. That's very magnanimous. I, I remember I tried to get tickets for the Albion over Spartans uh, last season, mm. and they were all sold out after eight minutes. I'm really, really annoyed. Really, really annoyed. That's that's incredible. That's that's good. The people the people that want to go will get to go in. And uh, I I I'm, I'm a bit more sanguine now. I was, I was totally thinking, oh, I can't have Sonar go down. But now having read that thread in Pine Bovro, I'm kind of like, that's if East Kilbride come up, then then so what? It's just a guy. A guy said uh, one of the East Kilbride fans saying, I don't understand why people are getting so upset. It's just football. And he's he's right. He's he's right. It's like 
don't get upset about clubs that you that you're we won't be playing against them next season. We're not going to be in the division next season. Might be playing against them the year afterwards, right? Enough. No, because you'll get relegated and they'll come up. No, that's so all right. Miss them again. So they they're going to relegate us in the playoffs. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Brilliant. Maybe and that's great. And then the. Their, uh, their media guy's going to crop up this video and make me look like a right plum. Can't, <laughs> can't wait for that. But Sean, I thought this podcast was only about 30 minutes long, but here we are. There's another 80-minute podcast in the can. Have you enjoyed this season? Oh, absolutely. It's been uh, it's been one of the better seasons I've had uh, cheering on Wraith Rovers. It's been a, a good laugh, and hopefully there is uh, there are more laughs to come. That's what we want to hear. That's what we want to hear. It's been the best of my entire life. I've had a fucking great time. <laughs> <laughs> it'll never be as good as this again I want to thank every single person associated with Stennis Muir the players the management the coaches the backroom staff the players families and the the, the supporters themselves I've had, I've had the absolute time in my life and, and, and of course thank you the listener because if it wasn't for you me and Sean would just be howling into the void um, complaining about misogyny probably but we <laughs> There's, if you like what you hear, please do think about subscribing to our Patreon because there's dozens of podcasts that go up there. There's dozens. It's brilliant. There's always something good to listen to. And Fowler's getting round at the moment to speaking to a lot of lower league fans yes. about how the club's mm-hmm. been for the season. He spoke to Dean McKinnon from the Just One Cornetto podcast about Morton season. Very good listen. I gave it a shot when I was in the gym and uh, it certainly helped me get through my reps. So if it's good enough for me, it should be good enough for you. And it's very much working, those reps. Uh, yeah. Those arms are very impressive. You saw the, the, the picture of me dressed as dressed as Kane there. That was one thing. The curve of the, the bicep and tricep and how it connects with the, the shoulder muscle. Very, very impressive. Just wait till the summer comes around. I've got another another month or so, another five weeks of uh, of the programme. So hopefully we'll see. I want, I'd like to think we get to the stage where I can post a picture online of me wearing no shirt. I, I mean, from a distance, it almost could have been Kane. Uh, when I say it from a distance, from a, a very long, long way away, but regardless, uh, still an impressive physique. I'll take that, Sean. I'll take that. Now, please, if you got get if you if your season's wrapped up, class. If you've got playoff games to go to, enjoy yourself. But unlike the Clyde supporters who went onto the pitch to celebrate Martin Rennie's goal. You know that video, Sean? It's a pub in England and it's like there's so many things happen. There's an old guy dancing yes. and then a, a woman, a, a sort of woman shuffles towards him and there's a little person that just walks by. That's what the, that's, guy in the leg brace. Yeah, that's right. That's what those Clyde fans look like at the, at the end there. <laughs> Enjoy your football, but unlike that, please do so respectfully. Take care. God bless. <laughs>